This week in IT, Windows is getting memory safe programming in the kernel, courtesy of Rust. Could Microsoft be developing an ARM chip for client devices that would rival Apple's M1 and M2 chips? And Amazon has announced it's a verified access service that provides secure access to corporate applications, but without a VPN. My name is Russell Smith. I'm editorial director of Petri.com and welcome to this edition of This Week in IT. So for those of you that follow what's going on in the Linux world, you might remember back in December 2022, I think it was with the release of the Linux kernel version 6.1, support for Rust was added. So that's support for writing actual kernel code in Rust. Now, how is that useful? Well, Rust is considered a memory safe language. So instead of writing kernel code in something like C, where programmers have to check themselves that there are no vulnerabilities in the code that they're writing, Rust is memory safe. So when that code gets compiled, programmers don't have to take that responsibility on themselves. Now, this is important because there are a lot of vulnerabilities in the Linux and Windows kernel that are connected to these memory type attacks. So the idea of using Rust is to try and make the kernel itself more robust against those threats. Now, I wrote last week on Petri with the release of kernel version 6.3, again for Linux, that they're now adding Rust support for user mode code in the kernel. So this support for Rust is becoming you know, more and more important. Now, this other news connected to Windows kind of flew under the radar a little bit because it was actually announced by David Weston, who heads up Windows security at, I think it was the Blue Hat Conference in Tel Aviv in Israel last month. But it's only been widely reported really in the last week. And that's that Windows is also going to get support for Rust code in the Windows kernel. And that support is going to be coming in the next you know, weeks or months. Now, it wasn't really made clear whether that was something that you'd only see in insider builds or whether it's something that would come into the stable version of Windows. That's not quite clear to me, at least at this stage. But, you know, Windows isn't being left behind with the Rust revolution, if you like. Uh, you know, so that uh, is something that, you know, Linux is also actively progressing with at the moment. So this was, you know, one of the uh, important features of the 6.3 kernel for Linux, you know, user mode adoption of uh, Rust support in the kernel. And the register had a good article really summarizing some of the things that were said at the conference in uh, Israel. So, you know, some of these core libraries are going to be rewritten in Rust. So, you know, that's obviously great for everybody in terms of security. So while Microsoft is looking to use Rust to replace some of the C++ libraries in Windows, this isn't the first time that Rust has been used in Windows. You can actually go back to 2020 and Rust was used to write uh, dwrite core in the Windows app SDK, this engine for text analysis, layout and rendering, you know, already has 152,000 lines of Rust code, uh, but still 96,000 lines of C++ code. So this is something that's going to be a gradual process of changing as much as possible to Rust. Now, there's also a performance increase potentially with moving to Rust of between 5 and 15%. But Western did note that it's not going to be a case where Windows is entirely rewritten in Rust. That's not going to happen anytime soon, maybe never. But, you know, whatever we can get into Rust, of course, just has to be good news from a security and performance standpoint. And I hope that it will reduce some of those vulnerabilities and patches that need to be applied applied to Windows going forwards.
Now, we've talked a little bit about Windows on ARM in previous weeks and how Microsoft is developing its own ARM chips primarily at this stage, as far as we've understood, for supporting Windows on ARM in the data center. Of course, its own Azure data center, because, you know, there are obviously needs to reduce you know, costs in terms of power consumption and to introduce all of this AI processing and just to be able to do it at scale and to be able to do it more efficiently. And ARM is able to offer that. But in a post that I noticed on Windows Latest this week, they have flagged up some job postings which have apparently been deleted where they're looking for specific roles in Microsoft's own silicon chip team that kind of indicate that they're developing something Think that's going to be a rival to Apple's M1 and M2 chips. And in my mind, that, that makes absolute sense. I mean, why would you develop, you know, your own ARM chips just for the data center? Of course, this has to be extended to clients at some point. And these job advertisements seem to suggest that that might be happening. And Windows Latest are also saying that they have indications that Windows 12 is going to be optimized for ARM and artificial intelligence, or at the very least, they will be a specific version that is optimized for the ARM platform and for AI. So apparently Microsoft has been looking for a principal system on chip silicon architect, a senior physical design verification engineer, principal design engineer, and a senior silicon power integrity CAD manager. If you have any idea what any of those things mean, then you're better than I am. Uh, but they seem to be suggesting that, you know, everything in terms of Microsoft producing its own silicon is racing ahead with its own specific team for this project. Now, it's interesting, of course, connected to Windows 12, because we know that Windows 12 is going to have various AI features built into it that don't exist today in Windows 11. And it looks like Microsoft has started working on some of those things in current Insider builds, like the new Smart Snap feature that will use artificial intelligence to kind of help suggest which applications should be snapped into the empty space, that kind of thing. And I'm sure there's loads of other things that we haven't seen yet. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about optical character recognition on running applications so that Windows has a better idea of what's actually running in those windows so that you can search for stuff that's in open windows. And of course, all that stuff requires a certain amount of processing power. And who knows, we may only see those features in this specialized version of Windows 12. That's for ARM and AI, I, I don't know. But it's interesting that, you know, Intel, the next uh, generation of Intel chips, and I think uh, AMD as well, will be including a special module for AI. So how all that's going to pan out and how these features in Windows are going to be available, will it just be on ARM? Is Microsoft going to extend these new AI features to Intel and to AMD if they include those AI processors? You know, today on Windows, we have software like DaVinci Resolve that has its own neural engine that does a whole load of stuff connected to AI. But in order to use that stuff, you need a powerful graphics card, you know, like an NVIDIA RTX. So, you know, you need specialized hardware to be able to use that stuff in applications on Windows today. So this is all moving forwards to standardizing this kind of stuff, bringing it into consumer hardware that, you know, people use on a daily basis without it requiring huge amounts of power, of course, which you would need if you were using, you know, professional video production software like DaVinci Resolve just to make it work today. So it'll be interesting to see how all of this stuff pans out with Windows 12 and artificial intelligence. Now, remote access, virtual private networks, VPNs, it's all big business. And AWS announced this week a new service called Verified Access, which they say is going to replace VPNs. So what exactly is this service? Well, as far as I can understand, it's quite similar to conditional access in that it's really for zero trust access to your corporate applications. So rather than establishing a, a VPN tunnel, you would basically verify the user's identity, maybe their location, maybe the security status of the device that they're connecting from, that kind of thing, before you allow them connection to the application. Now, 
Conditional access, of course, in Azure AD isn't a replacement for a VPN as such, but Amazon is advertising this service really as a replacement for VPN technology. And it includes some of those conditional access like features in terms of verifying the user and their device before they can actually connect to an application. Now, from what I can understand, this is really about making connections to corporate applications that are running in the Amazon cloud or what it calls virtual private cloud. So you set up your virtual private cloud. So it's kind of a, a logical private network that you can set up in Amazon's cloud. Now, I haven't really seen any information about whether this verified access service can be extended to actual applications running on premises in your own data center. I don't know about that. I mean, if you have any information, I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments below. But as far as I can work out, this is really just about applications you have running in a VPC in the Amazon cloud, at least at this stage, but I could be wrong about it. Now, this went into some kind of preview, I think private or public preview, not sure which, at uh, an event Amazon held back in November 2022. And this is now been made generally available. Now, because this is really some kind of, you know, connection, it's not just about the kind of verification part, uh, like conditional access policies in Azure AD, the way that this is being priced is a little bit different. So you're going to be charged for the amount of time that users access the application in your VPC, but also the amount of traffic that flows. So you're going to be charged for the time and for the amount of gigabytes. So, you know, depending on, you know, uh, how often, you know, users and for how long they're connecting to these applications. I guess that's a, a price uh, consideration that could quickly, quickly mount up uh, to be in quite a cost for your organization. So anyway, this is, you know, uh, really an interesting space right now because obviously organizations are having to adapt to hybrid work situations where we have users maybe in the office, some working remotely and that situation changing and users having to add, you know, I, well, not users, but IT having to adapt all of the time to where users might be located, but still providing them with secure access to applications. So this is another means by which you can achieve that. And there are all sorts of other ways to do this. You know, Microsoft has its own stack of zero trust technologies, which you can use together to provide similar features. And, you know, hopefully on Petri, we're going to start looking into this stuff in a little bit more detail to really help you understand this space more. If you found this video useful, then I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more news like this every week. That's it for now, though. I'm going to leave you with another video on the screen that you might find useful, and I'll see you next time.